Hey, good morning, everyone, and thank you very much for joining us for this uh, webinar, Air Today, Gone Tomorrow, hosted by Respublica uh, in association with our campaign, Airtight on Asbestos. Uh, my name is Jack Aldane. You've probably seen me before in other webinars we've done, uh, campaigns manager for uh, Respublica. And we are joined here for this talk today uh, by several uh, speakers, including MP uh, David Morris, uh, MP Stephen Timms for the Labour Party, and we have also Hugo Perez, Business Development Manager for ITGA, and our independent campaigner, Charles Pickles. And I'm now going to hand over to the Director of Respublica, Philip, to make some introductory remarks before we continue with this talk. Over to you, Philip. Th thank you, Jack, and welcome everybody to another Respublica webinar on uh, asbestos. We at Respublica have uh, run this campaign because uh, we think the ongoing asbestos uh, crisis is one of the great public health scandals of our time. Um, it kills, depending on how you count uh, asbestos deaths, it kills up to seven or eight times more people than fire. Um, currently, those who uh, work in the public estate, in hospitals and in schools, we are seeing a dramatic rise in death rates that is masked by the aggregate fall. We have technology available in Europe and globally that can address the cause of these public sector deaths, which is simply ambient exposure to degrading asbestos in, uh, in the air in which people work. These deaths need not happen. They produce enormous amounts of suffering and simply by doing what the HSE uh, should do by law, which is updating UK practices to best practices, we can minimise these deaths. And we're not doing so. And that is why Res Publica is campaigning for the adoption of standards such as we will discuss today. So thank you for joining us. Back to you, Jack. There you have a very neat summary from Philip about what this is to do with. Uh, and the sort of issues that we're going to be discussing throughout this webinar. So, moving on then, this uh, webinar, Air Today Gone Tomorrow, is to do with the management of asbestos in situ across the UK. Uh, in particular, the way in which it is monitored, or indeed in the UK, the way it is not monitored. Um, what I'd like to do is to share with you my screen in which I will outline to you the general problem that we're dealing with before handing over to Hugo. So here you see on my screen, the beginning of this uh, presentation where we go forward now to the problem itself. So the problem is that asbestos, as we know from previous webinars and from our literature and research is the nation's number one occupational killer causing more than 5,500 deaths in the UK per year compared to just 1,700 deaths in France. Death rates among non-traditional occupations, specifically teachers and nurses, have been rising exponentially. So this is not a historical problem, this is a problem for today. There are up to 6 million tonnes of asbestos across 1.5 million buildings in the UK and the current policy is to manage this material in situ, so in its state and condition within buildings. Now, the UK lags behind the regulatory practice of other countries, and we're going to be hearing more from that, more on that from, uh, from Hugo in a moment. And it's this that is contributing to higher death rates from unnecessary exposure to asbestos. When we say unnecessary, distinguishing between uh, people in trades that are prepared or are very much aware of the risk of exposure to asbestos they face, as opposed to those where the asbestos may not even be something that they're aware even exists in their place of work to begin with and wouldn't know what to do about it if they did. Air monitoring is a legal requirement only when asbestos is removed or needs treating. So it is not a routine activity and so cannot provide assurance of a safe level for everyday use of buildings and this is really the major issue that we're concerned here with. Um, the UK does not have a legislated environmental limit for asbestos fibres permitted as a safe level for everyday use, unlike other countries, France and Germany. And it does not have indicators for ambient exposure and, use, and uses an inferior method of microscopy 
again, something that Hugo will go into more detail with in a moment, which cannot detect all harmful fibers. So our goal is to limit the risks which those non-traditional occupations, teachers, nurses, and school children, importantly, are being exposed to every day. And we recommend that, and we've said this in previous webinars and in our previous literature, that the HSE accepts the findings of the French campaign that Hugo is about to tell you about and adopt the reforms to improve air, air monitoring of asbestos in the UK. Failing this, the HSE should undertake a simple program of research to test the feasibility of these methods. Okay, so I'm now coming back to you all and I'm going to be handing over to Hugo Perez, who's going to explain the story of how France kind of developed its air monitoring regime based on evidence and what we can learn from it. So Hugo, over to you. Thank you very much. Hi everyone, uh, thanks for the invitation. Uh, so firstly, I will uh, do apologize for, for my uh, English and uh, French uh, accent. You should be uh, understandable, but uh, maybe you will uh, hear a few mistakes, but yeah, you will uh, understand the, the presentation. So just to start, the quick uh, comparison between the United Kingdom and, and France. Uh, so we have approximately the same uh, population, 67.8 million for United Kingdom versus uh, 67.2 for, for France. Uh, regarding the asbestos importation uh, between uh, 1930 and 1983, so the UK imported like 5.3 million tons, that is uh, much higher than uh, France. So France is uh, 3.5 million. So um, there will be like more uh, in-situ asbestos in UK than France. And comparison between uh, deaths from asbestos-related disease, so we get the number that uh, Jack uh, just said before, 5.5 uh, thousand deaths a year uh, from uh, asbestos-related disease in UK against uh, 1.7 thousand in France. So. The goal is not to, to compare like a United Kingdom and France to say who is better, who is dealing better and so on, but just to kind of uh, sharing like uh, best practices and so on and uh, to see like uh, what UK can uh, pick from France and uh, maybe also the, the, the opposite way. So just to start, the total ban on uh, asbestos in France uh, came the 1st of uh, January 1997 and it came with uh, actually like two regulations. So the one for the public and the general uh, environment that we call the public code and one other like uh, only to protect the workers that is uh, affected by uh, the asbestos. So I mean the, all the asbestos uh, removalists, uh, asbestos assessors, but also like uh, everyone who is uh, working on the building and uh, can be, um, how do you say, can be linked with uh, asbestos containing materials as uh, plumbers, uh, electrician if you have to drill a hole when uh, asbestos is present so they have a specific regulation and so those two regulation is really uh, important to to understand for for the future of the of the presentation um, for each uh, regulation we have the obligation to to assess a place if the building is uh, built prior the first january of 1997 and we split uh, two kinds of detection. We have the high-risk material detection, which include uh, loose fill uh, insulation, uh, pipe plugging, but also false setting that we consider high-risk materials. So this one is really well uh, regulated because we have to do like a high-risk uh, and uh, mandatory periodic monitoring by uh, licensed uh, asbestos surveyors. So they will come between uh, from one to three years. Uh, so every uh, every year they will come and they will uh, see every asbestos containing material. They will, um, how do you say, they will study the deterioration of uh, the asbestos containing material. And if it's deteriorated, they will do like the air monitoring. And if the air monitoring result is above the environmental limit, they will immediately uh, ask for confinement uh, removal works until uh, the until the asbestos uh, exposure uh, goes down under the, the limit value. For the other hazardous materials and uh, asbestos containing materials that you can find into building, it's on the responsibility of the public owners and the employers to do their uh, hazardous material detection. 
but they have to keep under the environmental uh, limit. So the environmental limit nowadays is five fibers per liter in France. So it's the case from uh, 1996, from the regulation in France, and it is done by uh, the TEM, so the transmission electron microscopy. So this one is only for the public regulation that uh, I was talking first. And the second regulation uh, about the workers, from uh, 1996 to 2012, we followed the worker risk assessment uh, of the European norm, so done by PCM analysis, so another technical, so PCM is fast contrast microscopy, and we take another value that is the uh, occupational exposure limit of 0.1 fiber per cubic centimeters uh, analyzed under PCM. So we have two regulations, the public one and the workers one. The public is using the TEM, the workers is using the PCM. So we asked the question back in 2009 in France, like why we use TEM in one situation for the public and one we use uh, PCM in another for the, for the workers. So a lot of, uh, of uh, working group like uh, asbestos expert panel, but also asbestos uh, laboratory association uh, ask uh, the question like, is PCM relevant to assess occupational exposure uh, in our working uh, environment? And they also warn uh, several times the, the French government regarding the limitation of PCM. So for example, the PCM has a, a lower magnification that is time 400 uh, versus the TEM that is time uh, 10,000. Thus, the PCM has the inability to comb fibers uh, under 0.2 micrometers uh, width. So we will see later why it's really, really important. And the last biggest uh, limitation of the PCM is the PCM uh, is unable to, to focus only in uh, asbestos fibers. I mean, like when you count uh, asbestos fibers with PCM, you will count like every fibers, synthetic fibers, mineral fibers, uh, asbestos fibers and you don't have the inability or the capacity to focus only on uh, asbestos fibers uh, when TEM uh, does. Uh, in the same year, uh, 2009, uh, we have a scientific study published by the French Environment uh, and Occupational Health and Security Agency. So it was a scientific study and a toxicology study. And the conclusion was like in the, for asbestos fibers, we distinguish like three categories of fibers. So we have the World Health Organization fibers that is here. So the length of the fibers is about five micrometers. The width is between 0 0.2 and three uh, micrometers. And the ratio length width is about three. So this category of fibers, like everyone uh, knows uh, in the world, that is the well uh, recognized, but we have also two other categories, uh, categories. That is the thin asbestos fiber, that is really important. So the thin asbestos uh, fibers is thinner than the WHO one, because the width is uh, between 0 0.01 micrometers and 0 0.2. And we have also the short asbestos fiber that is shorter because the length is between 0 0.5 and uh, 5 micrometers. So why it is uh, important? Uh, it's because we did like toxicology study, uh, in vitro study and so on, on the, all the three categories of fibers. So it was proven that the World Health Organization asbestos fibers are carcinogenic. But in our study in France, we also proved that the thin asbestos fiber are carcinogenic. And for the last uh, categories, the short asbestos fibers, we, we cannot uh, exclude, so we don't say like it is carcinogenic, but we cannot say like it is not. So it's important because uh, back on the previous slide, we see, we see like the lab regulation for the workers. We were using PCM and the PCM is uh, unable to detect uh, fibers under 0 0.2 micrometers. So which means when you count with PCM, you only count the uh, World Health Organization fibers and you don't count or you don't take into account because it's undetectable under PCM, the thin asbestos fiber that was proven carcinogenic. And when you go back to the public health regulation in France, we use TEM, thus we see the World Health Organization fibers. We see also under the TEM, the thin asbestos fibers, and we take into account both categories of fibers because the both category of fibers are carcinogenic. So that is the read the question why we use PCM with a working environment. 
and why we use TBM in the, the environmental or the public uh, regulation. That is really this um, this problematic of uh, which country will, uh, will uh, which fibers you will count, sorry. And so the, after this uh, study, uh, we conclude that we should include the seen asbestos fibers into our uh, occupational exposure limit. And also we should lower the occupational exposure limit. So if we want to include the seen asbestos fibers in our occupational exposure limit, we should use the TEM instead of PCM. Because again, the TEM have, has a higher magnification uh, time 10,000. So it allows to, for senior object detection, including the seen asbestos fibers. And also it's enabled to do the distinction between uh, synthetic fibers, mineral fibers, and asbestos fibers. But before to add up the, the recommendation of this report, we needed to know if the seen asbestos fibers were present in our working environment and if the TM is uh, suitable, because it's great to see to say like we have to, to come the seen asbestos fibers, but is there any seen asbestos fibers in our working environment? So we launched uh, back in 2009, a TEM experimental campaign on, uh, on uh, 77 asbestos works. So we take like uh, more than uh, 250 samples and we gather all the data to do like a fibers distribution to, to know if yes or not, there is a seen asbestos fibers in our working environment. And the result is uh, on your screen. So seen asbestos fibers are present in our working environment. And uh, even bigger, that is a big proportion because on all the samples that we, uh, that we took and we analyzed, we see like uh, on average, we have like 70% uh, of asbestos fibers in our working environment against like 15% of uh, work as organization fibers. Which means like uh, when you take a sample with PEM and you, PCM, sorry, and you will uh, analyze the result, maybe you will miss like more than half of the asbestos fibers because you will not detect the seen asbestos fibers, thus you will not count them. So maybe you will miss a lot of fibers and you will say, okay, I am under the limit value because I count only the World Earth Organization fibers. But in the real life, if you take to account the seen asbestos fibers, you could be uh, really, really, uh, you could have a really high value and you could be like above the, the limitation. The campaign also teaches that uh, a non friable uh, asbestos content material could release more fibers than a friable one. So, for example, when you do work on the friable asbestos, it could release less fibers than the non friable one. So, we stop the distinction between uh, asbestos content material, friable and non friable. All asbestos content material is dangerous and you have to treat uh, it equally. Then we include the seen asbestos fibers in our uh, working exposure limit that confirms that uh, we took the, the good decision for the environmental limit to take into account the seen asbestos fibers and to use TM. So to include the seen asbestos fibers in our working limit, we have to use the TM instead of PCM because PCM is not able to detect seen asbestos fibers. And also, thanks to the toxicology study and the epidemiology, we divide by 10 the occupational exposure limit from the 1st of July 2015. So we divide by 10 from uh, 100 fibers per liter to 10, but we also include the seen asbestos fiber. So 10 fibers per liter, which means like we, we will count the seen asbestos fibers and the World Health Organization. So it's uh, really a, a, low, a low limit. So just a little conclusion, and I think that is the, the slide uh, of today, which is uh, really simple. So we did a lot of uh, scientific study in France to come in our uh, air monitoring regime. So we prove that the seen asbestos fibers are carcinogenic. We prove also that the seen asbestos fibers are present in our working environment. So we need to come them to, to better protect our workers. And then seen asbestos fibers are undetectable under PCM. So that's why we use TEM. So we use TEM for the working regulation and all the study also confirmed that we have to use TEM and to do air monitoring for the public and the general environment. So I think that's all. Thank, thank you very much and uh, happy to answer to all your questions and I hope it was clear. Thank you very much, Hugo. Uh, that was excellent.
if I may, I'm just showing you now my summary of this presentation, uh, as it were, to sort of say what this all means and what we should be doing going forward. The UK's health and safety regime under the HSC for the management of asbestos in situ needs urgent reform. This is what we're arguing. Unlike France, we have a system that does not provide mandatory periodic monitoring. Air monitoring only occurs in the event of removal uh, and re remediation. It cannot account for an environmental level of airborne asbestos or provide assurance regarding the safety of the general public. It uses an outdated form of microscopy, which uh, Hugo went into there, PCM, um, and cannot detect or measure proven carcinogenic fibers in the air. So this is about clear distinction of standards um, and the way in which we need to, to refocus on upgrading those standards and implementing them uh, as a matter of course in the UK. The HSC is duty bound, as David pointed out, under the Health and Safety at Work Act. So the questions we have to grapple with in the first instance are, why is the scientific evidence from France being ignored currently? And how do we convince the HSC to improve our health and safety regime? Uh, if I may, then I'll, I'll bring this over to you, Stephen, to, to give your remarks next uh, and say what it is that you think ought to be done. What can you do to help us in this endeavor? Uh, and, and by the way, to the audience, when it comes around to Q and A's, we can uh, clarify anything that Hugo has mentioned in the presentation. I know it's a lot to take in. It's a lot of very technical material there, uh, but there will be a chance to do that. So uh, be assured. Stephen. Uh, thank you, Jack. And I, I, I very much welcome this work. I, I welcome the ideas which are new to me at least about how we should more effectively monitor for the presence of asbestos. And I think it is astonishing that facts you've highlighted that over 20 years after the use of asbestos was banned in the UK, it's our, still our biggest occupational killer, over 5,000 deaths a year, and this does strike me as a, a very timely uh, call for action. Um, today's headline news does show a dramatic change of heart on the part of ministers about the desirability of government action to tackle obesity. Uh, the Prime Minister visited my constituency last Friday and he observed that uh, the graveyards are full of Tory party obesity strategies, but the pandemic has dramatically changed the political dynamics about uh, this. And I, I think we might be seeing something rather similar with workplace health and safety. Some of those who uh, well, ministers who took office in 2010 were pretty determined at that time to dismantle what they felt was kind of red tape around health and safety, needlessly impeding enterprise. Uh, and actually their more radical ideas never came to fruition, but funding for the health and safety executive has been uh, pretty severely cut over the last uh, 10 years. The uh, HSE had a budget of £226 million last year, which was about 15% less in real terms since 2013-14. The number of inspectors and inspections has been sharply reduced, as you'd expect, given that scale of uh, cuts. But I think we are seeing the pandemic delivering a new appreciation of the importance of health and safety at work. I mean, May ministers... Uh, uh, announced an additional £14 million pounds for health and safety executive this year, in part to fund additional inspectors. So I think it's a good time to be highlighting areas like asbestos, which does have a significant chunk in the current HSE business plan, but ideas like this that require additional attention and resource compared with what they've attracted uh, previously. There's lots of trade union interest, particularly on the part of UCAT, the construction union, and also the National Education Union, and there's significant parliamentary interest as well. The all-party parliamentary group on occupational health and safety has an asbestos subgroup, which um, has been arranging an annual seminar. Um, as shadow minister in 2015, I announced the Labour Party's plan for a national asbestos strategy, and the Labour Manifesto in 2017 included a commitment to, uh, I quote, the phase removal 
of asbestos from existing schools. I, I think uh, alongside the improved monitoring that is being advocated today, we, we do need to move towards a programme of removal when we've got the evidence uh, to do it. The Health and Safety Executive is accountable to the Secretary of State for Work and Pensions, and so it's the Select Committee, the Work and Pensions Select Committee, which I chair, that leads on the scrutiny. Somebody told me that um, HSE didn't appear before the Select Committee for more than 10 years. I don't know whether that's right, but it did appear at the first meeting of the committee, which I chaired um, in March, and they came back again in, in May to talk about what they were doing about the, uh, the, the pandemic. So, I, you know, if there is, if there was to be significant interest on the committee, there's absolutely no reason why we couldn't uh, run a, a short inquiry on this specific topic. I think it would probably need to be sometime uh, next year. And I think the, uh, the Res Publica work helps build a pretty impressive case for us to do so. I'm going to move over now to our, our independent campaigner and somebody who, who's really kind of brought all of this to our attention over the last year, Charles Pickles, to say uh, what you think really needs to be done. I mean, what Stephen said there is, of course, very encouraging and revealing uh, about the HSE's uh, status and, and the way in which it's engaged with this issue to date. Uh, but if you could, Charles, um, tell us uh, what do you think ultimately needs to be the sequence of priorities in order to bring uh, the HSE to account on this? Um, firstly, um, we have uh, in, in the UK um, our duty to manage asbestos in situ. Because we've got so much asbestos in the UK, really managing the stuff in situ is the only pragmatic solution. Um, but the, the cycle that we use is um, frankly not good enough. The, the only air monitoring standard we have, which is used on a daily basis, is called the, the clearance indicator. And it's set at a level which is described by the HSE as a level known not to be safe. So, so we've got the only number which counts for, for uh, uh, testing uh, for the UK's number one occupational killer is set at a level which is known not to be safe. I personally struggle with this uh, and I think I'm, I'm glad I was able to, to, to meet um, Hugo and indeed Dutch colleagues and German colleagues uh, and indeed American colleagues who, who adopted a much more sensitive regime uh, in, uh, for, for the testing of asbestos and, and this is really important because it enables us to get rid of this blanket presumption that asbestos in situ is, is, is all safe, which is what the presumption is, and, and, and test it effectively so that we can have greater assurance that the materials in safe. So, the, so all of the, mentioned, the countries I just mentioned um, have quite a detailed uh, in, um, air monitoring uh, regime, not for low risk materials, but for high risk materials. So these are, in, if you like, assumed guilty until proven innocent through testing, so that we can be assured on a day, a day to day or year by year basis that these materials that have to be left in situ for pragmatic reasons um, are safe and safe, safe or safe much much safer than we can be assured of otherwise so that so i think that, that air monitoring regime is is um is critical the other thing it, it does is where there are hot spots or dangerous instances uh, rooms or asbestos materials it will identify those so that those individual materials can be removed from the public estate without further delay so i think um i think it's time that the UK looked, um, looked at uh, a number of uh, international examples and uh, brought its regime, uh, air monitoring for asbestos regime, the UK's number one occupational killer, up to date. Um, that's all I'll say right now and I'm, I'm very thankful for Hugo for, for highlighting this um, at this time. Thank you. Yeah, there are a number of things to consider here, aren't there? The fact that, as Hugo's presentation made clear, 
It's about adopting the standard of practice, the best possible practice that will identify all kinds of asbestos in the air, uh, which PCM currently doesn't do. And this is, as Charles said, in order to ensure that the buildings that must go on standing at least for the next 10 years um, are assured to be safe, but that as you pointed out, Stephen, and as appeared in the uh, 2017 manifesto uh, for the Labour Party, uh, this puts us on a course for a proper phase removal program. Um, it can't all be done in one go, but it can be done much safer and with much more assurance than it is now. Uh, Philip. I think what I'd be interested in, Jack, from Hugo and, and from others is, is in terms of ambient air testing, is that now the, the norm elsewhere? Okay, so uh, is this something uh, that you could answer to, Hugo? You mean the, the question? Yes, yeah, the, 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 the ambient testing being the yeah. norm. Yeah, so uh, it's back to the one of the first slides. So firstly, we have the, the mandatory to, to assess and to do the first uh, asbestos survey in uh, every building uh, built pre or like the first January of 1997. Once we do that, uh, when you will enter in the building, you will have a document that you will already know like where asbestos is and what is the condition. Uh, for every asbestos containing material, an asbestos surveyor will have to come uh, between one to three years, uh, like every year, if uh, the asbestos containing materials uh, started to, to be like uh, deteriorated, or every three, uh, three years, if the asbestos uh, containing materials is totally intact. And in fact, the asbestos surveyors will come, so there is the licensed asbestos surveyors who knows when he has to take like air monitoring or not, and it will come like uh, every three years to see the asbestos containing material. And if there is uh, a little scene of uh, deterioration, it will uh, automatically uh, take air monitoring using like TEM. And when you will do like the air monitoring, if the result is higher the environmental limit, so five favors per liter, they will directly like take action until the asbestos exposure will uh, come down uh, so down five fibers per liters, or if they remove the asbestos, of course, they will not come again because the asbestos will not uh, be present. But it's important, okay. isn't it, that it's a mandatory um, and routine regime yeah. in France. How often yeah. are those tests undertaken in France? I mean, what regularity could we build in to the system in the UK if we adopt the technology of best practice? Okay, so it's every three years? Every three years. But the air monitoring is not uh, automatic because like if you, if you come like every three years and in three years, if the uh, asbestos containing materials is totally intact, we will not take uh, air monitoring. But if there is one uh, deterioration, we will take the air monitoring. But in any case, you will come every three years. You'll come but every three years anywhere using TEM, transition electron microscopy, the best standard that there is. And and this will be done as a matter of routine. Okay, so I mean, this gives us the, the, the basis on which to understand what best practice would look like in practice, not just the, the, mm -hmm. the abstract idea of the technology. Um, Stephen, you alluded to it at the beginning. Um, what would you suggest should be the first steps to bringing this to the attention of the select committee? And, and what, what would be the strategy, do you think, to try and, to try and implement this in the first stages? Well, I, 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 I'm certainly interested in this, and I think it's important. Um, one possibility that occurs to me listening to the, the discussion is that I, I could write, as chair of the committee in the first instance, to the HSE, just draw their attention to the points that Hugo has made about the better monitoring technology which is being used elsewhere, and perhaps about the frequency of, of checking as well and just ask them whether this is something that they should be adopting in the UK. Now, I don't know how they'd respond to that. Um, that. That's a letter that would have to wait until the committee meets in September because the committee has to clear such letters, but um, we could certainly get it off and let, then you know, see what they say in response and decide how to take it from there. Okay, um, really encouraging everybody listening now to file in your questions. Let's get the debate going. Uh, Charles, um, what Stevens just said there about uh, how to proceed, um, uh, is, is, that, is that satisfactory? I mean, what else would you say needs to be brought to the table on this, on this discussion? So, first thing to remember is because we've got 
so much asbestos in the UK in situ. We need to be utterly pragmatic. Therefore, what Stephen has suggested is utterly pragmatic. It, 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 what we have in the UK is an annual or biannual reinspection regime for asbestos materials, which is a visual check. What they have um, in France, Netherlands, Germany, uh, they back that up by doing an air test, a sensitive air test, just on the high risk materials. Here I'll be talking about, for example, asbestos insulation uh, board material in schools. So it's not the materials that, that harm us, it, it is the fibres which may or may not be emitted from those materials. So, so that really empowers the management of asbestos in situ. So, so, and also it enables phase, targeted phase removal, and it enables, um, as others have done, the adoption of a, a national asbestos strategy. So we've got to take the blinkers off, move, move beyond the policy, if you like, of deliberate obscuration by using any, uh, an insensitive technique, uh, which only see, sees about 15% of the, of the total asbestos. The more we see, the more we'll be empowered to manage our asbestos. The more we measure, the better we are to, to manage our asbestos in city. So, so I'm all, I'm all for um, Stephen's sentiments. I'm all for the approach in, um, amongst our, our nearest European neighbours who incidentally don't have half as much um, of an asbestos issue as we do have here in the UK. The UK is really in a league of its own in terms of its asbestos legacy and therefore ought to have asbestos legislation and practice um, uh, on a par with its problem. We don't at the moment. It's time to catch can, up. Can I, can I just check something, Charles? Uh, we, we've heard that in France asbestos is checked every three years. Are you saying that in the UK actually we check our asbestos more frequently than that? But it's, it's, the, it's the backup monitoring that we don't do properly. Yes, we, we, uh, there is a, a duty to reinspect asbestos materials within the duty to manage asbestos regulations. And that's done in high risk, high risk areas like, like schools, usually annually. Um, sometimes it's in less high risk areas, sort of um, a warehouse perhaps, it's done by annually. It ought to be done annually. But in the UK, we presume that all our asbestos materials are safe in situ. So, but if you think about the tonnage and the amount of asbestos mm. that we have in situ, it is a broader, a broader, the assumption is far too broad for it to be to be safe. I, I, the vast majority of asbestos will be safe in situ, but by no means all of it. And we need to identify these high risk materials so that they can be removed safely. It's, it's uh, we, we need to, uh, we need to move forward with it. And basically an enhanced microscope regime will literally enable, enable us to see dangerous materials. That point you just made, Charles, I think needs to be reiterated. Countries such as France and Germany uh, and others besides using best practices currently and with less asbestos in their public estate than the UK, which is not using best practice. This, this juxtaposition, this contrast is, is really the, the crux of the matter. Um, questions are starting to roll in. Uh, there's one question, Hugo, in a moment that will require you to uh, go over again your explanation of carcinogenic fibres, thin fibres that is, um, because of uh, some technical issues people were having just listening to everything that came through there. Um, but we have a uh, question here, and this goes to the uh, ability of the duty holder to do their job uh, much more easily and effectively in future from um, uh, an old friend of the campaign, Andy Payton, AP from uh, UK NAR. So if we can bring forward him to ask his question, uh, that would be great. Here we go. Hello, Andrew. 
Hi. Uh, yes, thank you very much. I found that very interesting. I mean, to me, I, I should say I'm a, a co-founder of UCNA, as we call it, UK National Specialist Register, which is the CIC. But um, I'm, I'm fascinated by the fact that Britain is unfortunately a long way behind it, it, some of its European neighbours. And I did the numbers just on what you said, the amount of tonnage that we've got and um, and the death rates and once you've allowed for that we still seem to be killing about twice as many people as France roughly if you sort of work that out which is not good when you think of the numbers of deaths per year but the challenge that I that I that I've got is I, I get the testing but how does in France how do they identify those premises particularly in the public estate, that are most at risk. Because in Britain, there is no central asbestos database. There is no register. I know just recently from what we've done, uh, we've just taken a little schools campaign, and I can tell you that 30% of those schools don't do reinspections no matter what's actually said. So where's the data that's going to help people manage this problem so that the air monitoring gets in. I'm assuming that in France, they've got a more systematic overview of how they do these things. Great question, um, Hugo. Uh, I, guess, I guess you got all of that, but um, it's a virtuous cycle, right? Once you start implementing the best standards of practice, TEM, you create a sense of where it is, right? But before you know where all of it is, how, do, how is it identified in France? So, like, we, we have the obligation to identify all asbestos in uh, in building. If the building is built prior the asbestos interdiction or the asbestos ban, so which means the 1st January of 1997. Once you have the, the document, so you have the document that records every asbestos containing material in the building, you have to reassess uh, every three years, uh, take air monitoring if necessary. And how we do that? So, we use uh, TEM also to identify asbestos in asbestos containing materials and not uh, PLM. And um, which is also really important is uh, the asbestos surveyors that will come into your building to assess if there is uh, asbestos or not, uh, is a, a licensed asbestos surveyors. We have a, a great uh, competencies because he will uh, have like a 20 days training before get the certification and after he will uh, get the recertification like every year and so on. So, so yeah, so we we done the assessment in every building built pre of the 1st January of uh, 1997 and uh, every asbestos assessor that will done the survey uh, will, will be uh, certified, uh, trained and uh, we know we are like sure of uh, his uh, competencies. I don't did know if I answered to your question or... Yeah, did that help Andy? Uh, it, it helps. It, it helps in part. Uh, I mean, I suppose you, there was a bit in your presentation that said uh, they identify when to bring in the air testing, and that is how. Do, what's the exact criteria again? That, that when they've identified this is this is where we need to bring in the air testing. Yeah. Okay. Good, uh, Hugo. If you don't mind clarifying that. Okay, so there is some uh, French norms and uh, all uh, asbestos surveyors uh, will uh, train like for uh, four months to know like uh, when they have to take the air monitoring and when uh, they are not. So it could be maybe uh, too complicated to, to explain this because like the asbestos mm -hmm. surveyor we spend like uh, two weeks or one month to, to learn that. Mm -hmm. but, uh, yeah, there are like uh, specific uh, specification to know when to undertake the air monitoring and uh, when you are uh, one hundred percent sure. Like uh, there is no asbestos. Yeah, yeah, that's right. that, that, that's that's helpful. I mean, from my perspective, I see that we need to do a lot more in Britain. There's no doubt about that. I'd be curious to know how many teachers and and nurses, and relatively speaking, die in France compared with with over here because we have a much higher rate. Um, but I, I mean, uh, what I would say to uh, what I'd say to Stephen is in terms of um, in, in terms of what you're trying to do there. I, I think it's all part of getting a, an asbestos strategy actually worked out um, you, in order to prioritize all the things that you need to do. The public estate in this country, if you were to go and ask lots of asbestos consultancies, they would tell you it's a mess. 
Uh, do we have anything uh, else to contribute on this on these points? Any of the speakers, yes. um, Stephen, Charles? Uh, I think I think Andy, you've been helped out with that answer, and that's great. And it's good to see you again. Thank you. Um, uh, I'm going to move on to some more questions in a moment. Um, Charles, you're nodding your head and thinking. There is there something you want to to say here? Yeah, I used to I used to run a company which uh, which had the UK's largest database of all things asbestos, and I, I'm a great advocate so, of having data to enable management. Um, so, so it really does help. So two things, uh, two or three things. We all our existing surveys, which every building, every commercial uh, building in the UK ought to have, um, uh, has. Um, has a, a classing of its asbestos materials in terms of high risk, medium risk, and, and low risk, R1, R2, and R3. So that would guide us as to where our an, an enhanced air monitoring strategy uh, should go. And so that, that might help you, Andrew. And my other point about the use of databases is when I had access to my old company's database, I queried its last 200,000 air tests, um, and I looked at how many were above and below the, the, the clearance indicator that we have, and, and there was a pass rate of 99.4%, which told me that um, the testing regime is unfit for purpose. It's just not testing. We, if you've got a 99.4% well, a pass rate, at a, at a level known not to be safe. There's certainly room for improvement. And I think we're, as an industry, perhaps guilty of providing false reassurance um, by clearing off areas um, which, at a, at a, which aren't, really, aren't really safe. And that, um, that's, I've, I feel quite strongly uh, that um, having passed off areas and passed off paperwork back to head teachers office managers, warehouse managers, you name it. Um, when I know that uh, the paperwork I'm handing on entitled reassurance uh, that these areas are not safe, um, and I, I feel strongly that this area ought to be uh, looked at. It's uh, as others have done. The level's just not good enough. In this country. You've, um, you've, you've absorbed a lot uh, this morning, Stephen. I, I just want to continue to give you the chance to kind of um, ask questions and explain your thoughts and and then again to return to the to the issue of how we how we move forward practically from here yeah I, I, I it, it sounds to me and correct me if I'm wrong about this it sounds to me as though the kind of essential framework in France and the UK is rather similar that is that asbestos has to be checked regularly by the sound of it it's, it's supposed to be checked a bit more regularly in the UK than it is in France. But I, the differences, if I've understood this correctly, are firstly that it's different kinds of people doing the inspection. Um, that in, in France it's licensed asbestos surveyors, in, in the UK it's I, I guess much less uh, well-trained people doing the job. But then secondly, if, if I understand it correctly, in both countries it's that if people see some deterioration in the asbestos, then they do the monitoring. And the fundamental difference is that in France, they're using much, much better monitoring equipment than is being used in the UK. Uh, have I understood that correctly? Yes. Yeah. Um, um, so the, can it, as far as I understand it, and, and Charles, can you confirm? I think the duty holder, the duty holder, uh, for asbestos um, survey in the UK, I think has just about a day or less of training compared with, um, as, as, as we heard from Hugo, um, you know, a, a very developed regime of experts. But perhaps, Charles, can you clarify what level of training uh, an asbestos duty holder might in, in practice have in the UK? Um... The person who does the reinspection needs to be classed as a competent person. Um, now, usually this will be um, a qualified asbestos surveyor who holds some qualifications and may have 
uh, six months or 10 years or even 20 years experience. Um, it's, not, it's not a requirement. You can have some asbestos, half a day's or a day's asbestos awareness training and then go and do your reinspection. Usually it's, um, usually it's a fully trained asbestos surveyor. The big difference is, how, is in how we, how we are able to treat these materials. In, in the UK, the presumption is really that all asbestos in situ is safe and where they have uh, an enhanced microscopy regime, the presumption is that high risks of that stuff like insulation board and insulation, uh, high risk materials are not safe until they have been proven safe through adequate testing. So, but that's the big, that's the big difference. It's, it's guilty until proven innocent rather than innocent until, until proven guilty for high risk asbestos materials in situ, which enhances our duty to manage asbestos in situ. So if you like, it enhances and enables our exist, works in harmony with our, our existing legislation, uh, the duty to manage asbestos in situ. Okay. So Charles, um, Charles is, it, is it the case then that typically in a school, they will call in a specialist company once a year to inspect their asbestos? Is that, is that what normally happens? Yes, that's typically the case. Um, terms like the company I use, my standard use for it, for, they're called in on a, on a usually annually, um, sometimes biannually uh, basis to re inspect all the asbestos materials. Uh, now, uh, the, the schools are a, a, a um, a unique case because uh, the young, the earlier you are exposed to asbestos, the longer a, a given cancer has to develop. So schools are, are, are school children are, are more at risk than older people. So if, if we were to do advanced testing anywhere, it ought to be in schools. My, my view um, is that certain materials used in schools really ought to be tested rigorously. I'm talking here about asbestos insulation board um, in, in, in primary and secondary schools. So that's a high risk material amongst school children who are vulnerable groups. They're even, even in Trump's America, uh, certain states use transmission electron microscopy to assure the, the parents and the teachers that um, similar materials are safe. It, it, the assumption that all asbestos materials in, left in situ are safe is, is a, a, a dangerously broad assumption, particularly in areas like schools where boys will be boys and they will kick balls against the walls and they generally lark about. Uh, and that larking about um, which is uh, which is what children do means that the building materials will be disturbed. So uh, and in, we we do have to have disturbance in order to to produce dust, but there will be disturbance in schools. And that's the thing is that disturbance is inevitable, as you say, Charles. But in the UK, our method of detecting disturbance has been very much based on the capacity of the human eye to see uh, visible damage. Uh, the difference between that and in France is that France actually looks at the things that human beings can't look at. Um, and, and that kind of brings us again back to the main point here. Um, we've got uh, a couple of uh, comments coming through, um, not necessarily all questions, but one worth reading out is from Liz Darlison, a uh, nurse consultant at Mesothelium UK. She says, we underestimate the effect of asbestos in terms of deaths in the UK as we don't capture occupation in people who die over the age of 70. Uh, this is a point that we talk about in our flagship report, Don't Breathe In, Bridging the Asbestos Safety Gap. Uh, she continues, the nature of a, a mesothelioma, the disease for any of you who are, aren't aware, most closely, closely linked to asbestos, means that a, a majority of those affected are over 70. Um, but again, with the point about schools, uh, it can develop very early on. Uh, and, and, you know, the, the amount of exposure needed to develop this incurable disease 
is very small in comparison to uh, the, the price paid for it. Um, if there aren't any more questions coming in, we might like to summarize at this point the, uh, the arguments we've had. Um, but uh, I want to give the opportunity to Stephen to, to make any further comments or to summarize, if you will, what we can do uh, immediately after this webinar to get the ball rolling. I think it would be good to lay out some priorities and, and sequence some actions. Well, I, I, I think the idea of me writing as chair of the select committee to the HSE about this in early September sounds worth pursuing. Um, I, I'd be very grateful for a, a draft letter if somebody wanted to put one together of the kind of things that we might say at this stage. I can then put that to the committee at the beginning of, of September and uh, write to them and, and see what their response is. Um, it does sound to me as though we've got a, a kind of framework which at least in outline is workable but we just need much more rigorous checking and, and monitoring at the uh, when the, 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 the checks are undertaken than we've got at the moment and I think there's a good case to be to be made to the HSE to introduce that and I apologize that I've got a uh, depart at this point but thank you very much for involving me in the discussion it's a very useful valuable exchange thank you very much for joining us and that sounds excellent so we'll look towards a draft of a letter at the beginning of september to the select committee of work and pensions and we'll stay in touch with you on that Stephen, and uh, put you in touch with david uh, who had to leave us a bit earlier today uh, in the webinar thanks once again um thank you. there aren't any more questions coming through we're going to try to get in touch with everybody who um, has has uh, sort of made comments and, and, and last minute questions, if any are coming through at this point. Um, but I'd just like to say a huge thank you uh, to everybody who's uh, presented today. Um, our director, Philip Blonde, David Morris, uh, Stephen Timms, uh, Hugo Perez, who's still with us here. Thank you so much for that presentation, Hugo. That was excellent. Um, and uh, Charles Pickles, our uh, campaigner and, uh, and good friend. And the presentation slides should be made available, uh, which means that anything during the presentation that wasn't clear or that you'd like to revisit, you can do. Uh, and uh, so I would just like to sort of say um, thanks very much for joining us. And uh, we look forward to staying in touch with you all. Uh, have a pleasant day. Take care.